Good evening. We're on the same side of the globe. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So you're just around the corner. Um, let me just introduce myself. Uh, this is, first of all, this is TMS Roundtable Global. This show, it's been about two and a half years. No, it's been three and a half years. Wait. COVID. COVID was three years ago, right? 2020. So it's been three years wow. since COVID, right? Mm -hmm. I need more coffee, but I'm not drinking coffee tonight. But anyway, it's been almost three and a half years that we are going live. Anyway, uh, you know, COVID, <laughs> I don't really want to go there. Anyway, it's been a long time and I'm not stopping because I wanted to say that this is, I think, number 100 and... 60 something and i i love doing this and it's from the heart rose and i because we love talking about healing and i want to let people know all over the facebook and the internet anybody that wants to be a guest this is not about like a cure this is about a journey and about a process and we help ourselves and help each other when we come live each week and it's a little bit triggering but it's fun so i'm going to ask Nari, how much fun it is in a minute. So I'm Dr. Tova Goldfein. This is TMS Roundtable Clinic Global. We are here to educate, inspire, and continue to bring uh, wonderful people to this platform. Nari, I like your full name is Narinda? Narinda, Narinda yeah. Narinda Sheena, what a beautiful name. I think that you found me. I forget. I think you mm -hmm. reached out to me. And that's what I wanted to say, like, if you reach out to me or I find you, just decide if you want to come, you want to be a guest, you want to bring your mom, your dad. We can fit four people in this virtual studio. <laughs> anyway, every week we're, we're here live. And then we have our, our YouTube uh, channel. So Nari is a coach. But more important is she's had chronic pain and in recovery. And even more fascinating is that you were a lawyer. Yes. Who wouldn't want to be a lawyer? Yes. Like so many people, they come from this place to be a coach because there's a calling. So I'm going to say no more. And I want to just first put your name up. Hold on. I want to put your name up, Nari. And I would love you to talk about yourself when it started what map coach means i like to like from hello like from the very beginning maybe you had a childhood trauma maybe some some stuff happened and then you became a lawyer and then what so start from the beginning and so happy that you're here thank you thank you for having me um and, and a lot of this work it's taken me a long time to realize a lot of this of connecting the dots um and I realized when I had the chronic pain, where did it start? What has happened to me? Now, my initial thought of becoming a lawyer, this was one for my parents, for my mother especially. Now, my mom, when I was young, she suffered mental illness. She has a mental illness, but she's beautiful, you know, inside out. And I always felt that need of people pleasing, of pleasing my parents. And I thought, what is the best way of doing a respectable profession? And law, actually, I, I always wanted to make a difference, always, because I thought to myself, well, how can I give back? And when you are young, you think of making a difference as humanitarian, which it is, and how are you best getting out of the clients and the service you're providing? Because there's so many skills to it. So in my journey of qualifying as a lawyer, I fell into, strangely enough, acting on behalf of clients, either representing them who had injuries, personal injury in road traffic accidents or accidents at work. And then I switched over to defend insurance companies wow. of people who had road traffic accidents who I used to investigate fraudulent. On both sides. Yes. So um, investigating fraudulent claims. And when I used to look at clients' medical records, I used to see they had more than one accident. And my job was to discredit these clients all the way to trial. So I'd go, 
there's no damage on this vehicle. How have they had the same injury twice? So wow. I'd go to the medical experts and I'd ask them questions and go, right, so you tell me that, you know, they can't have had another vulnerability in that similar area. They're like, yes, they can. There can be no damage to the vehicle. And I think, well, how's that possible? They're making it up because I had no knowledge of really what else might have been happening. And I kept seeing these cases where experts would go, we can't see anything wrong with them. So the prognosis, for example, would be six months whiplash, neck and back. They should have been recovered or 12 months dependent. If it carries on longer than that, they need to be referred for a psychologist report. And then the recommended treatment was either CBT or other sessions or counselling. So the client is none the wiser. Nobody knows the root cause. So all they're thinking is, mm. yeah, that's a whole nother show to talk about. Because as a chiropractor, I got very involved in that. And yet we now know that insurance companies, look, it's not if they could treat them with mind body work, it <laughs> would get better. So, okay, so you were a lawyer and you realize, wait a minute, but then you get chronic pain. So this is really interesting. So then I ended up switching my specialism from doing the lawyer work and I worked in-house. So I qualified as a coach years ago and I ended up working in-house performance coaching. But something was triggering. So my values were not aligning with the company I was working for. Now, you think they align because you think, ah, oh, those are the company's mission statements or values. Oh, that aligns with me. But in reality, it's around the people you work with. So it was triggering me and I felt unfulfilled and I thought, what is going on? This can't be right. And anyway, I, I knew I had some kind of high anxiety. Um, and and the, one how of the did big... You notice, how did you notice your anxiety? Well, I was getting um, like tightening of my chest. I was crying. And I used to think I was pregnant at the time with my second child. And I thought, this is a bit of a strange feeling. What is going on? I, I, with my second child, I thought I couldn't feel them and I was panicking. And then if I recollect when I was pregnant with my first child, my daughter, my dad was dying right in front of my eyes. And all I remember is I'm pregnant, the most happiest moment, yet my dad is dying from cancer. Oh, what a conflict. So what was, and at that time, what happened was, so when I was on maternity leave, I was in this really great position. I quit the job. And what I did, I took a few months out to care for my dad, but I went back straight into another job. And at the time of when I was pregnant, all I was focusing in was I'm taking my dad to an appointment, to a consultation. He's having chemo. That was my life. And because I lived with him before I got married, my nervous system was already hypervigilant. Not now because of my mother, it was also because of my father. Of, Is he going to wake up at night? Do I need to drive him to the hospital? So and you were I, a caretaker. Most definitely. And I didn't realize this until I started looking back and going, whoa. And it was big because I was getting married up that year as well. There was so much happening that I so couldn't many even big take it. These are big triggers. I mean, your father's sick. You're caretaking. You're becoming the parent. You're getting married. You're in job, you know, indecision. I think a lot of us underestimate. We think oh, I can handle this, but these are just, and they're all bringing up other things that have happened when we were younger because they're big decisions, big movements. It's very important for the listeners to to understand that we, you know, we we have to be in reality. I think we all think we can handle more, and then we then we judge ourselves because we didn't do it well, or and it's it's human. These human. You know, it's like you're a human being, not a human doing. So all these things are happening. So why was so why was in the thinking of practical, practical, practical? I didn't think about my emotions. I kept on serving. Yeah. So what I does kept love on, have to do with it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so and this is where I kept thinking, right? It's all practical. Everything's gonna be okay. And what happened was when I did go back to work, it was literally two weeks after my father had died. I, I, did, I was grateful that I had a lot of time with my father because I was on maternity leave. And I had the news when I was going to go back to work that 
there was a risk of redundancy for everybody. So a risk then, of, a risk of redundancy. What's that? So redundancy is like your job's on the line. So oh. everybody's job is on the line where they have to re-interview to stay at that job. And I'd only been the job prior to my maternity for about three months. So I literally passed you're my... You're still a lawyer. Now you're still being a lawyer. Yeah. So I'm still in this performance coaching and I'm there going, oh my God. What do you mean performance coaching? You're a lawyer and... Lawyer. So I'm a lawyer stroke team leader. So you're performance coaching the team that you're leading oh, okay. with the specialism. So it's all within the insurance company. So you're oh. doing a lot of jobs. So here I am thinking, oh my gosh. I am not going to get through this interview because I have been there the least amount of time and I'm coming back after grieving for my father. So I did that and I thankfully I was fine. I passed and however, I started getting headaches and migraines every few weekends on a weekend. Wow. And I used to think, oh, it's because I've been working hard all week. And now it's come to the weekend. I've had a lion. That's why I'm, you know, getting these. And it used to debilitate me to the point I had to go to sleep. I couldn't do anything all day. And I couldn't connect why this was happening. So then fast forward comes lockdown. I just been... Wait a minute. Did you go to many doctors and find out, like, what's wrong with you? No, because I accepted it. I accepted it going, oh, I've worked hard. I didn't sleep well. So I just convinced my brain, this is what it's like. And I've got a, a baby that's young, so that's why it's happening. So I didn't do anything more to that. I just thought, it happens every couple of weeks. It's okay. I'll deal with it like we do. And then what happened after that was, I remember lockdown was looming and I was watching the news like everyone else. And I'm pregnant with my second child. And I'm still high anxiously anxious. And, I'm, and I don't know what's going on with me. Yeah. And then February 2020, I woke out of bed one morning with a niggle in my right ankle. And I remember it really well because I thought, hmm, I've never had any pain like this before. So I walk out of bed and, I, and for two weeks, two to three weeks, I'm walking on it and it's not going away. It's not any higher, it's not any lower, it's just that this dull ache in my right ankle. And so my husband goes, why don't you go to the doctors to just check, get it checked out, find out what's going on? And I thought, yeah, why not? Now I know lockdown was happening, so I made the appointment, went to the doctors with the pram. Now, what I failed to mention is, I had my baby in the car. My what? baby was born in my car. Oh, my God. So I did, at the time. Um, so number one, your first baby? Second, second. So you, you, you were delivering so fast that on the way to the hospital, the baby came out? The baby weirdly came out in the hospital car park, in the car. Wow. Now, I, I had. Was that caught, scary? Was that scary? Yes. Um, I never experienced that. And I had called the hospital three times beforehand saying my waters are broken. This is my second child. I don't know what contractions are like because I was induced first time. And I said, can I come into the hospital? And they went, no, stay put. You're having a water birth. It's OK. And I'm there going, oh, what's going on? What's going on? And thankfully, my sister-in-law came and she saw me and she said, you need to go to the hospital straight away. So we're there driving on the motorway and I'm there going, please, God. And I'm praying, going, please, God, let my baby born safely at, just at the hospital. Thankfully, the midwife caught my baby in time in the car and he was perfect. He was absolutely fine. I, I wasn't. I was. So when I came out, I felt really faint. I was I lost a lot of blood and I had to have a blood transfusion. But after that, I. I couldn't connect it. I didn't see it as a trauma. When I look back, I go, that's a lot of trauma on the body. So I'm like, okay. Now that was seven months prior to me getting the niggle in my right ankle. So I'm there going, everything's fine. But I realized in those seven months, I was really down. I'd been so depressed. And I kept thinking, 
what's this feeling? It seems I like can't... all along you were you were doing a lot of repressing. Like I'll be okay, I'll be okay. I'm a leader. Mm -hmm. I had a baby in a car. I can do anything. I'm superwoman. I'll just keep going and going and going. Exactly. So I kept thinking, oh, I'm strong. I am. I can deal with another thing. Like as women, that's what we do. We just add it on to our list of, yeah, of course. But I wasn't. I wasn't coping. So I was still smiling and still confident, but inside I was crumbling. Wow. I had low self-esteem. I had all the feelings of depression. I had everything going. And I was overweight and I felt, what is going on here? And so seven months came. And at that time, I had to make a decision whether I stayed at work or went and so these thoughts kept coming into my mind. A lot of conflict. It's a lot of conflict. So when I go to the doctors with my pram, seven months later, going, I've got this niggle. The doctor assesses me and just tells me to do a few exercises like bending over, right? Doesn't ask me what's happened in my life or anything. I'm assuming he's had all my medical notes, so I don't have to really share. And then all he says is, try and walk it off. It's a herniated disc, it seems like. Try and walk it off, um, but I'll refer you for physiotherapy. So to me, that didn't seem so scary. I thought, okay, he thinks it's that. He hasn't said it in a scary way. Nothing else has been said. We'll see what happens next. So then I start walking for a, couple, a week or so, waiting for the appointment. Lockdown happens now. So I'm like, oh, okay, what's this? Is something new, but another unconscious anxiety there. Right, so then I get the appointment and so my pain hasn't gone and I've done my walking for an hour for a couple of times a week and then physiotherapy over Zoom. I never had physiotherapy in my life, so for the other physiotherapist to be on a Zoom call rather than physical therapy, it was like, okay. You were on a Zoom call for your physiotherapy? Yes. Wow. Okay. For the first initial sessions because we're in lockdown. Yeah, I, I thought nothing of it. So she's there going, can you bend over and touch your toes? And me going, yeah, I can do that. Of course I can. So I'm showing off. I'm there going, yeah, I can do that. I'm physically fit in my mind is convinced I've been this active woman for years, which I hadn't been. And so she was matter of fact. She said, right, you need to do some wall exercises with a tennis ball. Do them. Um, and... That was it. She said, you might have some nerve pain, sciatic pain. And it was relatively straightforward. Fine. Two days later, oh my gosh, my pain <sighs> through the roof. Wow. Through just, the roof. Just by doing a Zoom and a little exercise. The tennis ball exercise on my back. Not from the tennis ball. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So then what happened? So then I'm there panicking. My nervous system's now in that Something fight. Something is flight. wrong with me. I was really panicked. And then I tried to touch my toes as evidence, and I couldn't do it. And then I went to my husband, what's going on? She's, she's damaged me. Something's happened, what she said. So wow. I'm obviously thinking it's her. That's what she said, that this exercise, and I'm relating. So I get desperate. What's happened? Then that's when I first initially thought, hmm, okay, I need to find some other ways of doing something. Then I go on a call with her again. And then the second time, I think, yeah, second time she goes, yeah, you, you can't get surgery yet because we're in lockdown. And I went, surgery? What do you mean surgery? So she's obviously aware there's this sciatic nerve pain that's happening. It's pressing on the disc. She's like, yeah, just keep doing the exercise. Just matter of fact like this, no expression on. So that's wow. already causing me more nervousness. Sure. I'm like, what's going on so i'm there on google i'm like right I, i'm obsessed now so i contact this guy for some stretches in sciatica i went sciatica let me have a look he goes narinda do these exercises really helpful guy i said exercise i can't even do this it's the pain was you know a pain that's worse than childbirth yeah. i was like this isn't this is nasty pain so i went on google and i was like ah, back pain healing back pain and then Dr. Sana. Oh Dr. my God, Sana. Back pain. <laughs> oh my God. And you're like, what is this? Oh, well, okay. Let me see. Dr. Sana, healing back pain. And, you know, as a lover of Amazon, I went, I've got to buy it. 
I've got to buy this because I've got to figure out what is going on here. And I was still doing all this treatment with a physio. I even booked a holistic chiropractor initially. And he was really good because I went to see him. He was the only place open at the time. And he goes, Narinda, he started checking my body. And he goes, there's a lot of tension in your neck. I went, okay. And he goes, he was pressing on certain areas of my body. And I'm like, eh? what? That pain's gone. That, that doesn't sound right. And he goes, Narinda, it's okay. And so I said, but the physiotherapists have told me I need surgery. He goes, I don't recommend surgery to any of my patients. So then I'm confused. And I'm like, I don't understand. So anyway, I've got my Dr. Sarno book. And I'm like, right, it's thin. It's readable. I better start. And I'm desperate. I I need a fix. I'm desperate. And I read and read. And when he started talking about the tendencies, people who get this, people pleasing, the I subconscious. I just want to tell you that I never remember. It was one of the first shows we had Danny Fagan on the show. And she said, the book was written for me. I didn't <laughs> even have to... Um, I didn't even have to do, uh, you know, uh, she said she didn't even have to do, I didn't even have to do this. <laughs> I'll never forget. She's like, it was written for me and I didn't have to emphasize anything because it was all about me. Yeah. And that's like, so, and again, the majority of people are like, great, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a cure that I can be helped. And some people are like, oh, like, how can it be my mind? Like, it's, you know, people can go either way with reading Sarna, but this was your first exposure to mind body medicine. So, what happened? So, you read the book, you saw yourself in the pages, then what? Yeah. So, then I started explaining this. So, I had my, so the physio, so I went to a conventional chiropractor as well who did a bit of laser therapy. And, <laughs> Both the chiropractor and physiotherapist said, don't walk or run or jog for the, the typical six weeks. And I got a bit sad and I thought, no, what's going on? So Dr. Sarno comes and I'm still searching the internet. And then Serpa comes up, Georgie Oldfield. And I went, oh my gosh, I need to contact her. She knows about Dr. Sarno. Oh my gosh, let's see. So I call her up and in that initial call, I tell her, I said, look, getting all this pain it's got really heightened and i'm panicking saying wow. look i can't walk i can't walk I'm burning sort of burning was in my calves all on my right side i couldn't stand for longer than two minutes and she was very calm georgie she was amazing she was like, with georgie yeah I, directly Great. and she goes narinda she goes you'll recover and i went, what so, you know, you don't expect to hear those words, but she goes, you'll recover. It's like, but no, but don't you understand, Georgie? I can't walk. I want to tell you about all my symptoms. <laughs> I, I'm in the severest of pain. I feel, re okay, so how can you reframe that? Why don't you write down your fears? Acknowledge your fears. And I'm like, what? Is she understanding what I'm saying? So I'm there going, mm. now she said, these are stress-induced symptoms. And my brain was still skeptical because i'm like this is new this is all so new and i said but the physio and the chiropractor said i can't walk i can't do this she goes well what do you think and i said well i want to do it because it'll make me feel better well then if you feel activity then why not so there was a starting point where I go, well why not why not and i used to write my fears down so one of my fears was walking out of my house and being able to walk more than two minutes because after two minutes it would pull up and i'd have to sit on the pavement wow i could not i could not walk so you would two minutes the sensations would come back you would sit and then what and then i'd get back up give myself a couple of minutes um think come on Narinda, can i get to the first lamppost so i used markers and do you know what? There was a lot of behind the scenes work. So at the same time, Georgie had said to me in that call, um, you've got to understand, you've got to make sure you've got 100% belief. Wow. And I said, yeah, okay. My mind was still not there. So you had a little bit of doubt. Because I said, Georgie, but I've still got consultations. I've still got to have my MRI scan. Because obviously I'm thinking and catastrophizing. Of, did you even think how you did it? Like, how did you herniate a disc? You didn't do anything. I mean, well, you had two babies. 
took care of your father, maybe something. But then what was in the back of my mind when I think about it is when we were driving, when my husband was driving at like 100 miles per hour on that motorway, that at one point on the roundabout, he braked. And all I and I'm on all fours in the back of the car. Can you imagine? And You're thinking, that's what caused it. <laughs> yes. Okay. So you have some evidence. I have a herniated disc, and my herniated disc happened there, and it never got better. It's still herniated. Yes. It's still causing me chronic yes. acute pain. So okay. in my back of my mind, I thought that's it. That's what it was. My brain kept connecting okay. it to that. So, so I I'm was... reading Sarno. So you're still feeling a little bit of doubt. So read Sarno, and I and I heard from Georgie firsthand. You know, this is okay. I I I was on an online recovery course, which was amazing. And I think the first thing is awareness, and the second part was educating myself, re reading the literature, knowing that it can start from your childhood trauma onwards. So my brain ha had to have time. The unconscious part needed time to accept this is what's happening. And in between all of this, I started thinking, right, how can I help myself with this? Because I was obsessed with how can I recover? So I joined some private Facebook groups with SERPA and the TMS, Mind Body Syndrome, because I thought, I need real people to tell me. Now, Georgie had said there's YouTube videos out there. You can see but that wasn't enough for my brain. I needed real people to tell me. And that was such a great way. The community actually was a really big support wow, group for me. Hear that. Because I thought I was going along it alone. Because all I kept hearing from family was, what's happened to you? Or, for example, I was grateful for lockdown because not many people could see me and I didn't have to see many people. And in an Indian culture, they make a big fuss, right? But on the other hand, when my mum came to stay or my mother-in-law did to look after the children, they were like, okay, what's happened to her? Because I was in a different zone. My mind was elsewhere. It wasn't focused on the children. It wasn't focused on my husband or my day-to-day -day activity. It was focused solely on the pain. Wow. I was lying down. I couldn't sleep on my bed. I deteriorated. How many months did this go on? So I recovered fully after 14 months. Wow. But I would say even, so it started in February. Um, it was around Christmas. I was still limping. Yeah. But yeah, 14 months. And it was so up to the point. There were some mornings I'd be lying on the floor and I was crying saying, I need to go to A&E. I need to go to a &E. Just take me to A&E. Because there was something that, that really did trigger me. So the word surgery really caused me to get frightened. And when they said to me, when you don't feel your bowel movements, you need to go to A&E straight away. When they said that to me, I thought, what? Is this happening now? So I'd be on the, you know, am I feeling my bladder movements? So you and might have created exactly what they said. The yes. Of the brain. So, so wait a minute. I want to get some clarity. Um, so... You're reading Sarno, you're talking to Georgie, you're taking care of two young kids, you're seeing some improvement from the mind-body work, you're understanding your fears, then what's going on? So the doubt's still there, so I'm not at the 100%, because she says you you need the 100%, and I'm there going, yeah, yeah. So... And because I was having the medical treatment as well as doing this mind right. body, they're conflicting. Because I'm thinking I need an external fix when right. I need to fix myself internally by doing the psychological work. Right. So what was happening around all this time? I thought I'm waiting for my MRI. You know, like we're waiting for things to happen. Yeah, we want to get it. We want to. We want someone to call something. We want to give it a name. <laughs> and my brain. Uh, needed something more because I was catastrophizing. I thought, how about is there something else wrong with me internally? And it's not chronic pain. It's not a herniated disc. So that's, so obviously the lack of sleep, the nervousness. So, so I tell Georgie this, I go, Georgie, I've got an MRI scan. And she goes, fine, go for the MRI scan. If it makes you feel better, but you have read literature about back surgeries um, she goes, it lasts for two years. And she goes, unless you've made a lifestyle change, it will either go back to normal or you might have had the placebo effect. 
Now, in my mind, I thought, oh, maybe they'll give me a spinal injection. In my mind, I thought, maybe they'll just give me something to take the pain away. Because I didn't have any painkillers. I just took ibuprofen, but that didn't hit the nerve pain at all. And you were reading Sarna and talking to Georgie. Were you doing mindfulness? Were you doing journaling? Like, what kind of things were you doing? Yes. Yeah, so at the time, so then what I started, while I went on an online recovery, I started um, doing some guided meditations. I tried. So I, at the same time, I had psychotherapy. I said, Georgie, because I've read Sarna, I'm doing some psychotherapy. She go, that's all good and well, but that's your past. That's <laughs> not going to cut it. I'm like, mm. And the psychotherapist had recommended Headspace, which is a really good meditation. So there were a couple. One of my coaches, she recommended Yoga Nidra. Um, Headspace had little bite-sized meditations. And I I always knew of meditation, but I really never thought anything. I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Right. When I started doing the chronic pain meditation, like just to ease myself in the evening, it made such a difference. Like my nervous system started to calm down a little bit. I used to visualize a lot of I'm a strong tree and my roots are grounded. So I felt really strong in my body. And that was helping me to just alleviate some symptoms. That's amazing. And I want people to know the listeners that visualization is so powerful, whether it's from Headspace or, you know, I follow Joe Dispenza. I mean, it is so literally I. changing your nervous system. It's your uh, unconscious mind. No, your conscious mind is believing. I, I'm getting confused. Once you visualize and you imagine your unconscious mind, I think, believes. No, your conscious mind. Sorry, your conscious mind believes it's real. Like I'm imagining, I'm visualizing, I'm journaling. My conscious mind's like, yeah, this is really happening. You know, or I'm, I'm visualizing myself, you know, in the future that I'm going to get something done. Well, the brain starts to believe it. I, I, might, I'm, I think I'm saying it right. Anyway, and, and so what happens is that it becomes, it starts to create, it starts to plant, like, like carve the pathway. And then, of course, if you go ahead and, 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 start to do it like i'm going to go walking this afternoon i'm going to visualize myself walking and then i'm going to go walking and do a couple steps then you're you're literally carving the pathway you're literally like you're not getting rid of the old pathway that says i can't do this i'm scared but you're carving this new pathway and and again why i'm bringing this up is because lots of people do it and they don't get a change in their symptoms so it's not working but it is science when you visualize and you're you're now proof but you actually got a change in symptoms which is great it's great to get you know a positive change and get like we feel better like the dial turns down right away great i have less sensations i'm fine it's it's partly a combination of like accepting okay i have the sensations i'm doing everything i can i'm visualizing i'm journaling i'm breathing okay nothing's happening but you know what i'm building a new pathway I'm creating a change. I may not see the result I want, but I'm trusting the process. You know, it's like in the movie Pain Brain when Alan Gordon keeps, you know, throwing the ball and he's missing it. Throwing the ball and he's missing it. He's telling his brain, I'm going to put the ball in and I'm close. You know, I'm getting there. I'm not getting, I'm not dunking it. So I'm trying to help people who, who do all these things you're talking about and not seeing relief because. I don't want I don't want them to be so result oriented. Because what you were doing is you were training your brain. You were literally because uh, you were you were so you you were so sensitive to the sensations. You were hypersensitive. You were uh, so what you were learning is to be less sensitive. So that doesn't mean the pain might be better or worse. It means you're just getting less sensitive to do it less attached to the result. See what I'm saying? So can you talk about that a little bit so listeners yeah. can see that it doesn't have to be so black or white, I want less pain, I want less pain, or it's not gonna work. It's this process and the brain is really listening to us. So it's a, it's a mind body. Can you talk about that? In your yeah, I mean, it's interesting you talk about Dr. Joe Dispenza because I, I did some of his meditations in the mornings. I used to do 20 minutes. 
and it really created space for my thoughts and time and it wow. made me really emotional like so I've got his book I knew about Joe Dispenza but I didn't know how powerful his meditations were the guided ones because all I was focused on was I've got to recover. I've got to recover. And I was yeah. so focused, like you say, on the end outcome. You're result-oriented. Mm -hmm. And so what I did, I read The Great Pain Deception by Stephen Ozenich, right? Excellent. And I've got all my post-it notes. I've got them on all of the books. And I emailed him. I said, Stephen, oh, I'm in so much pain. All the gyms are closed in lockdown. What can I do? I'm no, surprised I'm... He, he actually did. He respond to you, of course. Of course, he hasn't responded to me or Michael Galinsky. And we, we, we tried to get him on the show. So interesting. Good for you. He's amazing. Yeah. He said to me, Just be because it's great that you're not going to the gym, you just need to be. So, what just be that's it. And then he goes, If thousands have recovered, what makes you any different? And I'm like, Ah. Okay, but this is amazing. So yeah, he responded to me and gave me some great advice. And then obviously I got into Howard Schubiner. I, I'm desperately emailing him and I give him the whole chronology because I think, because he asked me, he goes, so he goes, Narinda, let me be clear if it is TMS, um, give, give me a rundown. Where is the pain happening? So I'm telling him all this chronology. And he goes, all right, Narinda, your neural pathways are misfiring and you just need to soothe your nervous system. That's what he tells me, soothe your nervous system. So I'm thinking, how much more brain do you need? But my brain still... All right, I'm doing it. I'm doing exactly what you're telling me to do. I'm doing it. Can't you see I'm doing it? <laughs> and because I'm so... And what I had to get out was, this isn't someone else's journey for recovery. It's my journey. It's my emotions are different to someone else's. My pain perception is different to the next person. So I can't tell the next person when they're going to recover. I used to do a lot of good because I'm an NLP practitioner from before. I started remembering what I used to do. So in the mornings, I used to visualize being pain free when I got out of bed rather than going onto my side and sitting up because I had to find a maneuver how to get out of bed or get up because I couldn't even stand to brush my teeth. So I used to find visualizations of, right, I'm going to get up and I'm going to be pain free. I don't care what you say, brain. At the same time, I wrote positive affirmations. I am healing and I feel amazing. Wow. Because this is the stuff that when Georgie was, when I saw some of the problems, do affirmations. I didn't believe the affirmations. I'd read them first thing in the morning, last thing at night. Well, I'm well, I was going to say, like, we can, you really have to cement, like, to believe it, because the unconscious, the body keeps the score. And if your body's still having sensation, it's like, what is my body believing? You know, what's my unconscious mind really saying? Like, I, I, I'm, I don't deserve to heal. So, so you were doing the affirmations and what was going on deep inside? So it, nothing was happening initially. I thought, well, I'll carry on doing walking in the day. So I used to take time out to walk, make sure I did that. Um, and what I started doing, so a month before I had my MRI consultation, I thought, let me do a chronic pain tracker. It was my own tracker from all the work and the people I spoke to and the experts. I had Fred Amir's book as well. And I thought, ah. Oh. Forget what? Forgive for good? No, um, it's, um, uh, I think it's a pain recovery. Um, okay, look, okay, 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 different Fred. The Fred, Fred, Fred Luskin, that's Fred Luskin. For this is Fred Amir. And because I'm action orientated, I need something to track my progress. Because I needed my mindset to shift, take my little small steps and then progress. So I started every day, like he was doing. What are my little goals? So my goals were stand for five minutes even if it hurts stand Good for, for you five minutes. Good for you so you stood even having sensations all burning through trusting that this was okay i was not injuring myself because that's when you can bring safety it's not on a yoga mat no. but in crisis this is and what really helped, another thing, I mean, I, I was desperate, so I tried lots of things. One session of hypnotherapy, which didn't really do it for me. I did a bit of EFT, um, emotional freedom techniques, which was great for releasing emotions, but I needed more. 
So what I did was I went on the, I bought the Curable app. Oh my gosh, that was such a great app as well I'm because so happy to hear that. I was telling my brain, come on then, bring it on. Because what we're doing is we're afraid. We think we're going to hurt ourselves more. And when I got that app, I was like, what? Tell the brain, go on then, give me more. And it wasn't happening. And I was like, this is strange. What, what's going on here? So then I started listening to, I think, Alan Gordon. And he had this somatic tracking. And I thought, what, what's this somatic tracking all about? I was listening to some of the stories. And when they did the somatic tracking, I thought, oh, my gosh, how amazing. And then I looked at TMS Wiki Forum. I started working on that. And I thought, huh, this is, I'm feeling confident now. I'm getting reassurances. So the MRI scan comes. I can't, I can't sit. I can't lie down for longer than 20 minutes. It's 10 minutes. I, I'm limping. I've come to my MRI. And they go, wow. They go, <coughs> they go, it looks yeah if you again they'd say to me if you can't feel your bowel movements go to a and e straight away they just looked at me with pity and i'm there going, trying to align my body even though it's all burning um then i get the consultation and and he's like matter of fact and i and he goes surgery that's the only option for you surgery wow surgery wow now, Georgie, she's so good because I pestered her quite a lot on email. And she's a busy woman, right? She what? goes, look, Narinda, I'll tell you what. Don't show me the MRI scan. Just tell me what they say. And we'll go from there. And I'll see you okay. And he said, L4, L5, severe right disc prolapse. And because I knew what I knew, I wasn't fearful. And because Georgie had said to me sometimes, and, and I've heard it from other people, the brain sometimes needs a diagnosis. No word of a lie. Two days after that consultation, I walked for 19 minutes. That was the wow. last I'd walked for. You walked and there was sensations, but you felt okay? Or... I felt okay. And then it was after 19 minutes that I stopped. But I thought, what? Two days after my consultation wow so interesting so then i thought of course this is true and then i got Jeannie colwyn um, a coach in la because she had gone through nerve pain and and this kind of symptoms of tms knew i thought let me just grab her i need some just extra cheerleading and support and she was great because she gave me this motivation that i had already i was tracking it every day yeah that Jeannie, extra... she told me Jeannie colwyn Healed herself from fibromyalgia, I believe. Yes. I mean, yeah, she's, That's a big. Good, she's great. She's a good coach and she's really, you know, down in the, in the, in the dugout working hard. And she really, she was healed herself. And again, she's none of us, even me. I mean, we don't get rid of all these symptoms from different things, autoimmune. We learn to see what the symptoms mean they're not dangerous they can't hurt us the body's not punishing us it's protecting you so here you had a body that was doing so much protection you had a disc herniation probably with in the car with the baby probably was there way before but how did it become so active and so symptomatic and the dial was so up 10 is what we're looking at and then you're able to dial it down 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 so you had you worked with Jeannie and then and then what happened? And then that was it. I mean, she had obviously she does her breath work classes and I went to one or two of them and they were great. I mean, it wasn't something that I continued because I had found other methods, but what I what she gave me was that non-judgment as a coach, non-judgmental support. And I healed. I he absolutely wow. healed. I was doing my meditation. Uh, journaling so journaling was good but and I did that for a few months then I started just with my affirmations and she goes how do you have proof that you've healed so I started writing all the things to confirm I can I can wash the dishes standing up oh my god I can walk with my children I can pick them up so I was doing I was already living proof and I thought to myself oh my god I'm sitting on this chair I couldn't sit on this type of chair uh -huh. If I had this, the pain would be so severe. I'd go straight to the floor. Wow. My crutch. My crutch was <gasps> floor. 
go to the floor. So you stopped, did you stop with the physical, the chiropractor and stuff? You stopped with that? When I, once I, yeah, I cancelled it because I, I trusted Georgie. I looked at all the evidence and I'd, I literally had four sessions of physiotherapy and they said to me, Narinda, you need to come inside to the physiotherapy. You know, what, what do you mean you're not recovering? So I started sharing about Dr. Sano and you know what she did? So I'm in severe pain and she puts me up against the wall and makes me do more exercises. So I'm there like, oh, I'm really shaking because it's so painful. But because I'm a people pleaser, I don't say I'm struggling to stop. I'm like, <laughs> you know, in pain. And um, I'll go away. She goes, you're going to have to do this a hundred times because there's no surgeons available because of lockdown. Okay. I went, all right. Are you quit. thinking about surgery? No, not at all. What I, I was convinced. I thought, they're not listening to me. I told the holistic chiropractor about it. He was so in tune. He goes, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. I even went to two different other chiropractors, and I even emailed them both because they were very skeptical. And I said, I've healed by myself. Thank you for what you've done, but I think this is really good for you to know this. I didn't get a response, but wow. that's okay. So... So I'm, 14, I'm sorry to interrupt, 14 months later, you're having no sensations or sensations occasionally, I mean. Nothing. Wow. No burning, no nothing. And I had all burning pain. I had all the numbness. I had the wow. tingling, numbness in my, and tingling in my right big toe. Because wow. I was scared because these sensations were new to me. And numbness on one side of my body I was like. I couldn't sit on the floor, you know, you cross your legs sitting on the floor. So, what's happening? Crazy, raising two children, two young children. Wow, wow, wow. So you stopped being a lawyer and did you get a coaching degree? So I already had a coaching. This is a weird thing. Oh, right. So, so 2012, I was um, an NLP practitioner. I did a, a really great coaching course. Um, with Toby McCartney in London, and uh, it really helped me doing a lot of visualization. But what I did was I didn't continue with that. I thought I used that in my learning for legal. Then I did an energy leadership coaching course with IPEC, which is amazing, which is why I went into performance coaching in a company. But again, it triggered because the values weren't aligning. And now I'm I'm on my second coaching, actually, because I love learning. You know, you never stop once you're on this journey. So I'm doing it. Really yeah, they say when you stop learning, you're dead. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm doing the neuroscience positive psychology with Optimus Coach Academy. And amazingly, that is aligned to the mind body. It's all about coaching the whole person, which is what Dr. Sarno says. You can't separate one from the other. Like you can't go, this is just physical. You can't say this is just psychological. It's about, for me, is moving the body. When you start moving the body in a comfortable way and go, okay, what else can I do? Everything else falls into place. What That's what I found for me is once I started being a bit more active, my emotions were getting a bit more. Huh. And when I started knowing the sensations in the body that make me anxious, I went, hmm, let's do some belly breathing. So let's now you live, I'm going to interrupt because... You know, you meet people, sometimes they say, you know, Doc, I want my pain back because I can't deal with my emotions. I can't deal with my anxiety. So talk a little bit about how you are dealing with Nari. How are you looking in the mirror and loving Nari? How are you accepting that you love to please people? How, do you, how are you accepting that, you know, how are you accepting who you are? Like, how are you living with you, who you are? How do you? Talk a little bit more about yeah. The, I mean the, the relationship with yourself, which obviously improved, or you accepted, and then that helped to also contribute to the. Year. So I started doing what my biggest values are. Now the top one is self care, and in self care, I've put things like being kind to myself. I'm never kind to myself because I used to be like, oh come on, Narinda, like my gremlins. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. And then you have judgment. Wow. So I started going, oh, my gosh, Narina, look how good you are. Or uh, in the but evenings, I do how a does lot somebody, of... Uh, Nari, Nari, how does somebody, like, how does somebody get over that? How does somebody, like, just shift into... I, I spoke to someone today, and I said, well, what is it? 
How does it feel to love the part of you you don't like? How does it feel to like the part of you you don't like? And to accept that you don't like certain things. Like you don't, you can like not like yourself and not have pain. Mm -hmm. But there's some kind of I don't like myself and there's a big conflict going on. That's what's causing the pain. So we're not saying you have to love yourself 100% and be like, but you have to have a, a health, some kind of healthy self-talk, acceptance. Talk more about that a little bit. I think sometimes also, like if there's things going on, if it's relationships or anything else, like you've got this unconscious anger going on, you have to really figure out what's going on there. Start figuring out what, where's that coming from. Even asking yourself, what, what is this brain pain bringing me? Like forgiveness. And when I talk about forgiveness, it's really hard. But forgiving yourself sometimes, like if things have happened in your life and you felt guilt over it, Forgiveness comes to oneself first before forgiving others. And I think you've got to accept where you are. You know, a lot of the time we live in denial. We really do. And we don't see denial. Us. Stop for a minute. We live in denial. Yeah. And what is that? That's it's like we're not connected to exactly. ourselves. We're not connected to our truths. We're not listening to ourselves. We're not seeing the whole picture. Mm -hmm living in denial and um, so you've got to really the, the the hard work is doing the inner work that's what i had to realize is that only i can fix me and it doesn't matter about the length of time so those that are still going well i've tried all these methods not working it's about just being like stephen olsen you said just really let go of what the outcome is and just know that you're safe know that you've done nothing to hurt yourself and really what are the things that bring you joy i started doing a list of all the things i used to do as fun who was narinda before she was a mother before she was a wife even as a daughter who who what is my identity i had to figure that out i was in i was in denial as well that i had been really active but the, the reality was I hadn't been active since I had my daughter. I wasn't. I hadn't done the things that I used to love, activity-wise, gym-wise, being in sports, doing things I enjoyed, going out for dinners with my friends, just even having a phone call with people. I started getting insular. And I think when you start doing those things, all that's happening is you're in that spiral of, frustration and despair and what you want to focus on is what am I grateful for what are three good things that have happened in my day yeah. and that's what I do now like switching my emotions of if I know something may trigger I focus on how can I help myself going forwards wow so you know we can be focused on ourselves. that's that's what we need but in this loving compassionate trusting i mean again it's it's you had a remarkable recovery nari i mean i didn't realize after speaking to you briefly in the prep i didn't realize the extent of your symptoms that wow. was really uh, you really uh, are sarna you're like a typical low back herniated disc had plenty of reasons to have a herniated disc a baby in the car another baby of course I mean, but to go on so long and for you to keep trusting your body and now to be on the other side of it. Wow. I think I had a lot of faith in God as well. Okay. And that every time I used to pray from a young age, I trusted. And then doing the meditations, you get more connected to the, you know, people who are spiritual, they'll know that connection's yeah. there. Yeah. Can you talk about the article? I did post it. You wrote about you wrote an article on LinkedIn about how your meditation was like your medicine. Yes, because when I was doing the guided meditations, they were very much like I was visualizing. So, like I said about the tree trunk, about the roots, I stood strong, and I was there going, "Ah, oh, I'm so strong." Or when I was doing Dr. Joe Dispenza's, they made me cry. I literally was crying doing his meditations because. You, your imaginations go into such a different mode of thinking, like the neural pathways are rewiring. 
And that's what was amazing. And I'd get up and I'd go, I'd be motivated. And the pain would just reduce, seriously just reduce. And I'd be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Wow. It just gave me that belief. It gave me that time and time and space. Like he says, it's all about your feelings, your thoughts. What are those thoughts? Repeated patterns. We don't even know we're doing it until we start observing it. So, so true. Nari, I'm so happy that we met. I mean, I, you know, there's so many different people that I'm so blessed to meet, but to have like a, a real herniated disc, low back Sarno story and to see what you've been through. And, you know, like it wasn't like, look, I don't know about your childhood, but obviously you're in a healthy relationship with your husband and your parents and your children and thank God. And, you know, you, but you really were resilient. You really were just, you just, you, you doubted, but you stayed with it. And I know there's people that I, I talk to and they, they, they doubt every day, but they stay with it. They just trust the process. And it's so important. You have to just, you know, see the forest from the trees or somehow know that you're not being punished. I talk about forget or that you're not a victim. And I think you, you had the confidence. I think you had the confidence. Are you still there? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think you had the confidence and the trust because maybe you had a good childhood, you know, and that you were able to manage the traumas, the big T's and the little T's and somehow incorporate them and, and continue to trust. I don't think you started, I don't think you ever at any point hated your body. You were just like confused and you were like, cause it is like, you want to be like, what's going on fear? What's going on with my shame? It's, Come on, anger. Let's talk about this. Let's figure this out together. Mm -hmm. Somehow, I'm getting that you had that ability. Yeah, and, and I, I don't know if it's my experiences with NLP or energy leadership because I have a, the energies I have, but I trusted it. And like, you know, I was initially like, oh, I can't recover like they recover. You know, initially I was like, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not you might have felt some jealousy, you mean? Yeah, like I, I've read about people who've had book recoveries. I was like, well, what? No, that's not true. And there are, there's genuine book recoveries. And I was like, oh. And the more I kept looking at other people's story, it helped me with the real people. The more I kept going, when am I going to recover? Right, like more judgment. So I thought, I've got to really let that go and start just focusing and Smart. trust. And I did it in small steps. I didn't look at that biggest outcome. And my yeah. husband, who suffers chronic pain now and again, even he didn't believe, even though it happened in front of his own eyes, he goes, you're different. Ah, how am I different? I'm no different to the next person. I wow. am no different. Wow. So this is amazing. And I'm really happy that this is going to be on our YouTube I'm going to change the name. I, I really, um, you know, I wrote Unlearn Pain because we are unlearning it, but I, you really have a saved by Sarno's story. And it's not even that, I mean, Sarno is doing what he can. It's what you did with the information. You know, like even Alan Gordon, the movie Pain Brain said, this book, he said, I don't really talk about Sarno anymore. I don't mention it with my work more, but, and he said, the book didn't, he said, the, the book didn't help me at the time, but this man changed my life. And I think it's important to keep going back to the basics. Even now that I'm into PRT and, you know, like the pain brain and love heals that movie. And I'm just loving all these different proofs and, and evidence. Um, we always have to go back to the basis that we're repressing feelings. The brain is perceiving a threat. It's living in fight and flight. It's habitually, automatically doing this to protect us. And we've got to sometimes get to the core feelings through trauma. And, you know, my, my, I, I always like to repeat what Dr. Clark says, you know, can you be a butterfly on the wall of your childhood? You know, and here's this 
gastroenterologist that's helped so many people with inflammation and pain. He's just like, can you be a butterfly on the wall of your childhood? Because he's connecting so many symptoms and conditions with childhood, adverse childhood um, experiences. But, he, but we can get over that. You have overcome that childhood trauma. So you can overcome this. And that's a fact. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Like you have been able to overcome adversity. So it's it's like, yeah, we become cheerleaders. And yet, you know, as long as we can take their hand, our clients step by step, but you have an amazing story, amazing story to tell. And I, I love that you're you're a coach now and that your map coach means mind action progress mind action progress it's really a pretty physically act react and, and then and then in there somewhere we're feeling and getting better at feeling so what i do is i usually say about awareness and education is a first step then belief as a second step then the mind or mindset then action then progress then the last step is self-care because if you forget once you've recovered, it's easy to forget and go, I'm recovered. But you've got to make sure you have your self-care to make sure you don't go back where yeah. you were. Does your, you could your sensations ever come back? No. Nothing? No. I've had like the odd headache, but I know how to deal with it. And I tell my brain off. I'm like, yeah, I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. Get a life but, brain. Get a life. You know, what, what, what the, the best thing for me, pain is a gift. That I, I read that, and pain is a gift for me. Because if I hadn't had the pain, how can I share my story or help other people transform their life like I did mine? And, and this isn't to say it's easy or that this will happen for them, but it's that point of knowing there's hope, giving people hope that, yes, you can do it. And we will help you do that through coaching. Wonderful. I'm thrilled to meet you. I'm glad that you seeked me out. And... We'll meet again. When Rose comes back, we'll have another talk about how scary it was to deliver a baby in the back seat of a car. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and that little baby that's going to grow up is going to be traumatized. Yeah. So, Where were you born? <laughs> and anyway, it's good. You're a wonderful mom and you're a wonderful coach. And I'm really happy to meet you. Um, for anybody that's out there that's listening, um, Nari, I will put uh, your name and information on the YouTube also, uh, your article is on the TMS Roundtable Clinic Facebook page. There's tons of resources. And I'm just thrilled um, to meet you and, and have you share your story and drop pixie dust in my studio. <laughs> oh, no, thank you for having me. So Maybe we'll be in touch. Me. We'll meet again. Definitely. Okay, all the best. God bless. Thank you, Tova. Okay, so wait one second.